All right. So as usual, Dr. Morris, you might need um, to go guess, back out yeah. and reshare because people can't see your screen. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I can't see the comments. All right. Thought maybe we'd get lucky this time. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. If not, I guess just give me a holler. I cannot see the chat box, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'll ask that everybody does mute themselves at this point. <clears throat> so as usual, um, if you are not here with the schools or the health department or otherwise invited on the call, we'll ask you to drop off. The information will be posted on our website just in the next few days. Um, pass any information that's needed on to your uh, support staff and others in the schools. Um, Major Oler, are you on the call? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. So um, Major Oler is going to talk to us a little bit about some options for uh, testing and vaccinations that the National Guard can provide. So I'm going to just turn it over to him and let him speak and then let him handle any questions that might might come up. So go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so the, uh, the basic capabilities that we can provide is COVID vaccination and uh, testing. Um, we've done different venues where we've just done uh, straight immunizations. We've done where we've combination of COVID testing, I mean, it's, uh, COVID vaccinations and testing. And then lately, especially within the school districts and everything, it's been um, coming in and uh, doing the testing, you know, to keep the schools open and then working with the different school districts and then going from there. The other thing um, that Dr. Morris and I were talking about too, is we have the capability now, if we're scheduled to do COVID, um, either vaccinations or that we can also provide once we get the, you know, the allocation from the health department do flu um, immunizations also. So it, uh, it's been nice to help out the health departments with respect to that, especially when we were doing uh, the boosters, you know, uh, for Pfizer and some of the other ones where, you know, we're getting an old, older old population. They were coming in for the flu shot, so we were doing both of them at the same time. So we have the capability of doing that. The biggest thing is once there's a need is um, my email and my, my cell phone's on there um, to get a hold of me. And then what I'll do is basically get a hold of our um, people that do the scheduling and then help you um, get it on the schedule. Uh, on the, the state website so it's on the schedule as soon as possible so that we can you know provide the support and going from there. Any questions on that? The other thing as an aside kind of interesting I just got selected also as the director of testing for the state too so I'm going to be leaving my guard role and then going to the state shortly within a couple weeks. So obviously testing is going to be near and dear to my heart and having um, the different functions that I've had. So I will probably be hearing from you uh, in my other position shortly. So also. Any questions or? So, uh, yeah. Go ahead and ask if anyone has any questions. I'll try and pull up the chat just in case. Um, <clears throat> so I think everyone can probably see the questions, the chat box right now. Um, so do you mean a one-time event or can you provide weekly testing or daily testing? Yes, to so all that. So it depends on the venue and what um, what is needed. So. Um, so say, for example, we're doing some stuff in Bay County or we're starting with one and we're probably going to go up to three or four sites 
and and again it's based upon you know um, um, positivity and then keeping the schools open so they have you know the requirement to do the testing and then the schools know which students need to get tested based on the close contact and everything and then they send them over to where the testing is available so it it, it literally is based upon the need And then your contact information when you do transition to the state, will that stay the same? Well, if you're going to use the guard, um, then I'm uh, probably going to keep that. But um, using a guard, yeah, I'll probably find uh, you'll you'll get some contacts in that. But if you're getting a hold of me when I transitional from the state, I, I will figure it out who who would be best able to serve, and then you know going from there. And then obviously if the guard is, I think I know some people over there that I can have them contact you. So I'm sure he'll stay in touch and can pass on information. Absolutely. If other contacts. Yep. And I have a feeling your Michigan.gov email address will probably stay the same. Yes, I think they will. Yeah, they were just talking about that today. I got an email said, I, well, you already got it. I think we're going to keep that. So I said, yeah, probably <laughs> a good idea. Yep. And if anyone ever needs help setting up testing or anything, you can contact me or um, the health officer or your county nurse and we'll figure it out. Um, Penny asks about testing on site or at the school and I can let um, Major answer that too, but I think it's basically wherever the site is best, right? Yeah, it, and again, it depends on the areas like you and I were speaking to and then depending on the different school districts, you know, how rural they are, or how urban um, and just try to make it as um, easy and accessible to the parents and time wise and things like that to, to make it as seamless as possible. That That's bottom line, the goal to um, so that we could keep the schools open. I mean, I I know personally. I mean, I know what had happened with my kids. You know how how it affected. You know, with uh, with regards to breakouts and stuff like that, and with the burden. And we were lucky enough. We had two teenagers, and I know I had friends that had you know kids in three different schools and different. Uh, what a mess. So, you know, so trying to you know coming from also perspective of a parent too. You know how easy. We want to make this and seamless and to you know keep kids in school and do what you know do what we need to do and then what kind of testing do you provide do you have antigen testing or pcr testing or both uh predominantly we do all antigen testing and um normally uh, depending on the venue we'll have from the health departments what the next step we what we'll do is we'll do a test and then we'll give the student uh, a sheet of paper that basically name date of birth uh testing site date and whether they're positive or negative and that's what's been sufficing to take back to the schools so you know basically it's like their hall pass to get back to school or to be able to go to school and then it's been the antigen if they do come up positive it'll be dependent upon the health department and whether PCR tests are available right then and there, or we'll have information on where, what to do next. Basically, you know, go home, I, you know, quarantine and the local place to do a confirmatory test. But the, um, the uh, schools will get, you know, notice of that also that all right, we had a positive antigen test and then the next step forward. So, but predominantly uh, we're doing all antigen tests. Any other questions anybody has? Otherwise, I'm going to. And usually that. to um, get it started, we would probably need 48 to 72 hours to make sure we got all the planning in place and all the logistics handled, you know, et cetera, to, you know, to get it to get it started. So if anyone has any interest or any questions, you can follow up with 
major Eller and get more info. And again, if you think of it in the future and, and you forget which slide deck to find that info and just shoot me an email and we'll set, send that information on along to you. Um, we've had a few schools who have used this service um, and you know, if they wanna share some experiences, they can otherwise, if you need to talk to a school that's used them, we can always see if, if they would be willing to talk with you. Um, and I just saw a question about source for test. Oh, sure. For, yeah, normally, I mean, uh, the schools are supposed to be requesting them. That is one thing that we're going to look at as a supply chain. Um, can't give you a definitive answer, you know, from the state with getting in that, but we in the interim have been helping out some schools with using our own test and then, you know, replenishing our supply. So again, it um, the the first course of action is if you can get them through, you know, through the schools. Um, but if for some reason, and that's why we work on a case by case basis, if we're, you know, depending on the duration and how long we're going to be there, um, you know, guard using um, their um, supply, and then we would request to get ours backfilled too. So um, try to do the best we can. Other questions? All right. I really appreciate you joining us and sharing that info. Um, hopefully, we'll have some people take you up on the offer. Um, and again, if anyone has further questions, uh, reach out to Major or you can contact us and we'll, um, we'll connect you. And hopefully uh, the outbreaks not get less and less. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's our hope too. I know, but I think this the testing is probably going to be uh, long term um, solutions and coming up with uh, you know the best course of action that we're going to try and do from the state perspective too. So, I'll stay. Um, right. I'll stay on for a little bit longer. I got it. I get a meeting at 1.30, but then I'll stay on for, for that. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity. Again, we try to make it, the biggest thing is tr basically try to make it as seamless and as easy for the schools and the parents, you know, because it, I mean, there's enough on everybody's plate to begin with, with everything that's going on, so. Basically, options for testing, not just outbreak response, but surveillance testing or test to stay options or things like that. So hopefully keeping keeping outbreaks from happening. Great. All right. Um, well, in the same vein as vaccination clinics, um, I know we're getting into flu season and hopefully some more options for boosters. Um, we may be able to help you with that. We're getting really busy, obviously still busy with case investigations, um, but you can contact us in our offices. Um, for the counties of District 10, you can contact your immunization coordinator for the other two districts. You can contact your COVID contact person. And you know if we're able, we can try to set up a vaccine clinic if you have a large amount of staff to be vaccinated. Um, again, the National Guard may be another option for that. And we do have, several pharmacies that will set up on-site clinics as well. Um, so I just want to mention now that that might be a good option for your staff to provide that kind of an opportunity to try to encourage vaccination to keep people at work over the flu season. Um, and just some updates with vaccinations today and tomorrow. The FDA, the Verb Pack Committee is meeting to discuss the data from Moderna and Johnson & Johnson um, regarding their proposed booster doses. And they're also discussing data um, in consideration of whether or not to allow for kind of a mix and match booster. So if you got one type of vaccine for your primary series, 
um, getting a different vaccine for a booster. So those discussions are going on today. And then October 26th, they anticipate discussing the data from Pfizer for the 5 to 11 year olds. The advisory committee for immunization practices from the CDC does have meetings scheduled on the 20th and 21st and November 2nd and 3rd. There's no agenda released yet, so we don't really know exactly what those meetings are for, but it's suspected they're for follow up of today. So just I, I put this together to try to explain this whole crazy process. So um, VERPAC is an independent group of scientists, researchers, doctors that are not government employees. Um, they are a committee of the FDA that looks at all the data and efficacy, safety, things like that. And they give their opinions of what to FDA of what FDA should do. Um, then the FDA looks at that. They're, they then make an approval or an authorization based in part on what FERPAC recommends. And they also make sure the manufacturing sites are safe. So they inspect the companies, make sure they're clean and safe um, before they give and continue to give their approval. So that's one step. Then the ACIP is a similar committee, but an offshoot of the CDC. So it's a group of independent scientists um, working for the CDC to review safety and efficacy information. But they also look at you know, cost effectiveness and is there enough vaccine for everybody, um, risk benefits, things like that. Um, their recommendations don't always align with the FDA. Sometimes they recommend less use, sometimes they recommend more use. Then those recommendations go to the CDC and then the CDC sets the um, immunization schedules and recommendations based off of the recommendations from that committee. And sometimes they change a little bit too from that. So that's the whole process. That's why, you know, there's a meeting and then another meeting and then another meeting and another meeting before we finally are able to go forward with using a vaccine a different way. So um, I just wanted to try to illustrate that whole process better because I know it's about as clear as mud can be. Um, just resharing a couple of resources to help you have information to help promote vaccinations, whether it's in your in your communities, in your students, or in your faculty. Um, again, especially as influenza season's coming up, and um, you know we worry it, it'll be worse than last year was. Um, just wanted to clarify a few things we've had some confusion or questions about over the last week. Um, we've heard just very rare reports of even some healthcare providers recommending some different approaches to isolation. So that's in people who are sick or are positive, um, recommending different days of isolation. Um, just a reminder, it's 10 days from the onset of your symptoms, or if you have no symptoms from the date of your test, um, so the date your test was actually performed. Um, again, if you're fully vaccinated or if you've tested positive within the last three months, you don't need to quarantine. Um, you do not need to test negative before leaving isolation or before returning to work. We've also heard um, around the state some employees saying that their employer is requiring a negative test to return to work. Um, so again, that's not necessary and it can actually cause a lot of confusion because you can get persistently positive tests. Um, a, a negative test is sometimes recommended in people that have been really severely ill or have a really severely compromised immune system because they can sometimes shed infectious virus for longer. That would really be up to the decision of a specialist to make that decision. So um, just, just a reminder on some of that. The other thing we've gotten some questions on, and I know this is confusing, um, but we have, and the state has also given some um, leeway on, on quarantine modifications and one is the test to stay plan um, where the recommendation is students need to have a negative test prior to going to school for the seven days after their last exposure, um, again, before going to school. So it only has to be before going to school. So it doesn't have to be every single day and it just is for the seven days after their last exposure. So I did make some illustration of how this works um, because they don't need a total of seven tests. 
Um, it doesn't have to be for a total of seven days. Um, like in this scenario, let's say somebody was exposed on a Friday. Let's say they found out over the weekend that they had been exposed and they're going to school the whole next week. They would just need to be tested on um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because their first two days were over that weekend. In the second example, let's say they were exposed on a Monday to somebody, but they didn't really know they were exposed because that person hadn't been diagnosed yet. And they found out on Wednesday that they were exposed. So by the time they have their first test, it's really day three. And then day four would be Friday. They're not at school on Saturday or Sunday. And then the final day, day seven, would be that Monday. So hopefully that illustrates a little bit easier how that testing would work. Um, you know, it's similar to isolation. You know, you just isolate 10 days past the date, last day you were exposed. It doesn't mean you isolate 10 days total. Um, you know, if your, if your last day of exposure occurred three or four days ago, um, you wouldn't have to isolate the whole 10 days. So again, I know, very confusing. Um, just a reminder for your most up-to-date data, you can go to the mystartmap.info. Um, I just, I did pull some data just to give you an idea of where our counties are standing. Um, most of our counties are, well, back up. I listed these from the highest daily case rate to the lowest in the state. Michigan averages at 312 cases per million. Um, most of our counties are above the state average. Um, we have six that are in the top 20. We have 12 that are in the top 40. So I just wanted to point out that we do have some counties. I'll, I'll just kind of leave this here so you can look at this. Um, the Northern Michigan counties, and there's been actually some news articles about this. I was gonna share them, but I didn't wanna be um, a major downer today. But um, the Northern Michigan counties, the more rural counties, those that have lower vaccination rates are really dealing with some of the highest case rates at this point. Um, I am gonna click the slide here. This is the vaccination rates that I pulled again from lowest. I, I, sorted it from the lowest one dose rate to the highest. Um, and again, most of our counties are below the state average and um, a large number of ours are in the lowest 20. Um, and you'll note a lot of them are also correlate with the ones with the highest case rates right now. So, um, Kind of going back to the reason I shared the toolkit for promoting vaccination. Um, this current surge is just this real slow burn and it just is, I'm not sure how or when it's gonna ever end. Um, I'll show you an interesting graph here a little bit later. So these are the hospitalizations for our regions. Again, it's not for our individual counties, it's for our regions. So it's a little difficult to interpret um overall they've gone down a bit um still higher than they have been in the past um over the summer but gone down a bit this table is some or graph is something new that's been shared to us from the hospital association this is for the entire state um from the beginning of the year and these are daily pediatric hospitalization counts um so we're getting pretty close to where we were during the spring spike. This is just over the last 16 weeks. So this last number here, 42, was October 9th. Um, so just to show the increase more recently. Um, just like in the past, um, this shows the total cases in five to 18 year olds for our 19 counties in the green line and the comparable weeks from 2020 in the orange line. So this is for the 19 counties that would be on this phone call. Um, we're up to 654 for this past week. And then we'll go county by county, remembering that your vertical axis is different for different counties. Some have much more than others. Um, so this first one is Aranac County, Clare County, Gladwin County, 
Isabella County, Osceola County, Roscommon County, Quinton County, Gratiot County, Macomb, Crawford, Kalkaska, Lake, Manistee, Mason, Acosta, Osaki, Nuego, Oceana, Wexford. So from the state's data and modeling report this week, um, the percent positivity has continued to climb over the last few weeks. Um, it did hit a low at, I think it was 8.8% 8 .8 a few weeks ago, but it's been creeping back up again. The case rate has continued to climb and has been climbing for the last three and a half months. Um, the 10 to 19 year olds continue to be the highest case burden in the state. Um, there were 161 new outbreaks this past week and um, K through 12 continues to be the group that has the most outbreaks. Um, so this is the cases, the weekly cases per 100,000 in the state. Again, it's just this slow, persistent increase rather than the, in the past we had a really quick increase with a more rapid decrease. Um, we were seeming to plateau a bit and now we've seen a bit of an increase again more recently. Um, this just shows the cases by age group and um, this blue line here is the 10 to 19 year old. So they again continue to be the bulk or continue to have the highest case rate for age. Um, interrupt, but we yeah. can't see your slides right now. Still, okay. I don't know why this happens. All right, so hopefully that helped. Um, I'm not gonna read all this. I, I do update this each week, but there's not huge changes. Just basically since the beginning of COVID, 16.3% of all COVID cases have been in children in the last week or the week of this report, the 30th through the 7th, they represented about a quarter of all cases. Um, Almost 5% of all visits to the emergency department are for COVID-like illness, or no, actually for diagnosed COVID. Previously, that had been for COVID-like illness, but now it's diagnosed COVID. So that's, to me, that's quite substantial. Um, our hospitalization hospitalization rates continue to climb. Um, again, you know, usually it's been this rapid increase. Um, and relatively rapid decrease, yet this time it's just been this persistent, painful increase. Um, I included this time our ICU census um, just to show that it is getting close to what it was during our last surge. Um, this slide, not that it necessarily concludes anything, I just include it because it is an interesting illustration this blue line is what our surges have looked like for this calendar year, and it's superimposed over the um, the case rates for last calendar year. Um, so just illustrating how last year around this time is when we had our fall and winter surge. We're going into that time frame now already increasing. Um, differences though is that we had you know, a very large spike in the spring, which should hopefully have given a good deal of people some natural immunity. Um, and we vaccinated half of our eligible population. And so hopefully we're not going to see a second surge in a surge. Um, but we've also seen some 
mutations within the virus. So it, it's really, really hard to predict anything, um, but just kind of a, a warning that we're hitting the season here now. Um, this is just a illustration. The blue line is Michigan and the red line is the US from March on. Um, just kind of illustrating how we've really not followed the US quite as much. We had a, a much larger alpha spike in the spring. Um, and then this spike has come much, well, not much, but about six weeks later. And we're still increasing while the most of the US is starting to go down. So hopefully we will start decreasing soon, but just to illustrate, we've had a little bit of a, of a difference compared to much of the US. Um, again, with outbreaks, Half of over half of the new outbreaks have been in um, child care or school related settings. Um, there's over 3,000 cases related to child care or sorry, school K through 12 settings. I did graph them out, I just think it gives a little more meaning. The green line are ongoing outbreaks, the orange line are new outbreaks each week. Um, and then this green line is the number of cases. The green line is cases associated with ongoing outbreaks and the orange line are cases associated with new case, new outbreaks each week. So it's about the same each week. Um, this just shows cases um, by age group, by time. So just showing the school age group, which I've been showing you each week um, related to the beginning of school and how that has increased and the dark pink section here is that age group related to the other age groups in Michigan. A lot of our schools did go back to school in the spring. You remember a lot of the schools, larger schools, especially in the south, didn't go to school most of the year like you guys did. Um, and so that caused a larger proportion, I think, of that age group back then too. Um, this slide was presented last week as well, but I think this graph um, might illustrate it a little bit better. Um, just the potential for higher case rates in those schools that um, have fewer mask rules or regulations. So um, that is my last slide. So I will um, stop sharing my screen at this point and I will go to questions. All right. So update on teachers, school personnel being prioritized as critical personnel as it relates to COVID boosters. So at this time, the boosters are open for everybody. You should not really be having an issue getting access to boosters. If you are, please contact me or your county nurse. Um, but there is no prioritization at this point um, because it, because we don't have access issues. There, there's not a shortage of vaccine um, at this point. So the other thing is, is that the priority is actually in those that are over 65 and those that are at high risk for complications. That's who the booster is recommended for. Um, those with high risk occupations, um, may get the booster. It's not recommended, but it's an option for those groups. So they're not actually even in a recommended, a high recommended group. So, um, so the first priority is to get those over 65 and those that are high risk for severe disease, like people that are in long-term care facilities vaccinated. But again, um, if you're having access issues, let us know and we'll try to help get that worked out. Uh, many schools have drinking fountains and are currently only utilizing the bottle fillers. Any recommendations? Um, Steve had put on there that drink, there are no limitations on drinking fountains at this point. Um, he did put a link in the chat box uh, for guidance. Um, it probably includes in there just a reminder that any any drinking water source that's not been used for a while does need to be flushed properly. Um, so there are no um, restrictions on drinking fountain use anymore. 
Did all schools in your service area receive the letter from the superintendents and board presidents around September 30th? Yes. We sent that to everybody. It was exactly the same and it was done that way for that reason that it was everybody. Just to make sure everyone had the same information um, because we know not everybody attends these calls and we knew that not everybody had the same information. And we don't know who doesn't attend the call. So we just had to be kind of even Steven and, and educate everybody in the same way. Um, so just questions about slides. Um, are you tracking the number of positive cases that specifically include vaccinated individuals? Half of our adult cases in the building are vaccinated. So yes, this, this one week I did not include that slide, but um, in the report, the link is in the slide deck. In that report every week, the state shares the number of what they call breakthrough cases have occurred. Only 7% of the cases of COVID in the state of Michigan have occurred in fully vaccinated individuals. We also get a report regularly about the num about the cases in our jurisdiction that are in those that are fully vaccinated. Um, so we, yes, that is closely tracked um, and reported on pretty much every single week in that data and modeling report. Um, I have shared it in this talk from time to time. Um, I just didn't share it this week because I think I just shared it last week and I didn't want to bore you with the same info every week. Um, how do we get antigen tests at the school? I filled out a form and haven't heard anything. I'd like to send people for quick tests um, or have them ourselves so we can coordinate appropriately. So historically, you go through your ISD and they order them through the state, but we've heard that they have shortages right now and no one's really been able to, um, to get them. So, talking to Major Uller may be an option to get some testing set up in your area until there is more available for you to get directly and do that yourself. Um, there is a email address and when we're done, I can find that and put it in the chat box or if somebody else um, from the health department can do that while I'm talking, but there is an email address to the testing department at the state um, so that you could email them to and ask them the status of your request and you know what's going on where why haven't you at least heard back from them because you should at least get a response back. Are you aware of any forthcoming communication related to the vaccination mandates of employers for over 100 employees? Um, I actually just looked this up yesterday for um, another question from a community member. Um, so they're supposed to put out official guidance with uh, um, a opportunity for community com for comment um, in October. So that is supposed to come out sometime this month. I expect then they'll allow people to give comment and then finalize the guidance. So all of that's still in process. Um, so basically all we know and all you would know at this point is what's been said in press releases and news releases. The official rules and, and guidance is still being written, um, but it was said that it would come out in October. So. Hey, hey, Doc. Um, the 31st. Yeah. Hate to yeah. interrupt, but uh, Major Uller has his hand up. He wanted to respond to that last question about testing. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was wondering, I just spoke to um, in the testing side, it, um, and I, th I think Dr. Morsha covered in that the for the individual schools putting in the request through the ISD and it has to be on the ISD dashboard and then fulfilling a request. I'm trying to get the link again sent to me my email so I can put it up on the chat and then uh, go forward there. I just sent a uh, text out to see if I can get sent that the the link to do the request through the ISD. And, okay. and yeah, and I and know it's, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's on the state website as well. Um, but yeah, if you can pop that in there, um, I know it's 
that there has been frustration because they've been told, yeah, the, I'm getting a message back from that poster saying that they filled out the request a month ago and have not heard anything back, um, which is really frustrating. So that's why in that situation, I would suggest emailing them and, and saying, you know, why haven't you at least told me I don't get anything? Um, but I'll if you want to send me that. If you want to send me an email, I'll follow up because um, I, I just looked at my email. I know I got a couple emails already with regards to that, and then I can follow. I'll, I'll send it directly to the testing team and to to follow up on status and everything too. Okay. So Hillary, if you could email Major Aller, if you feel comfortable with that. Um, if not, if you need any help connecting with him or anything, then you can just email me directly. Okay. So it sounds like she'll get in touch with you. So great. Um, Roger. So, all right, that one I answered. And then just a comment about we are having a lot of vaccinated individuals getting COVID. Um, yeah, again, the average right now is about 7%. But that is also why you know, there is a recommendation that everybody, regardless of vaccination status, do wear a mask at this point. Um, and so if your staff are not wearing a mask, you may encourage that. You may want to provide KN95 masks. There is so much disease burden in the community right now that you know a 90 or 85% effective vaccine has much more opportunity to fail just because they're being so bombarded with virus. So again, that's why that recommendation is there. Um, can you please show the clarifying slide again? Thank you. Okay, let me. And I think that was the one with, um, sorry, I'm just scrolling through here with the isolation recommendations was the one that said clarifying. If that's not the correct one, you just let me know. So this has been the guidance for isolation for quite some time. So you need to be in isolation for 10 days past the day your symptoms first appeared. You also need to be at least 24 hours without a fever. So extremely rare situation. If you're on day 10 um, from when your symptoms appeared and on day 10, you happen to spike a fever, then you need to stay in isolation one extra day. Um, and your symptoms are improving. Again, with that, usually people by 10 days are feeling better, but if you still feel horrible at day 10, you should stay in isolation. If you're feeling better, you're not going to be 100%. You might still have a little bit of a cough or something like that. But if you're feeling better, um, there is mention of how the loss of taste and smell may not come back for quite a long time. So obviously, you don't need to wait for that to improve, to leave isolation. Um, you don't, there is, there used to be at the very beginning some strategies to test negative before you left isolation. Um, that's no longer recommended. So relying on the time-based method rather than a test-based method is what's recommended. Um, did, well, I'll just click to this next slide. The next slide had the test to stay examples. This is coming from the modified quarantine guidance that we sent out a while back. Um, we described it, but I didn't really illustrate what it meant to test for seven days past your last exposure. And you know it, it's kind of difficult to conceptualize what that meant. Um, if there was something else you wanted me to cover, please just holler out real quick before I stop sharing the screen. All right. Um, Guidance says that if they test negative on day six or seven, the child can return on day eight. If the test on day four or five is negative. So the state, we haven't, in our health departments locally, we have not really endorsed 
be test negative to return for quarantine um, plan. The state of Michigan has endorsed it. And so what they are saying is if you test negative on day, I believe it was day five or six or day six or seven, um, they can return to school on day seven. They asked if they're in quarantine. Um, I just want to make sure the children can test on day four or five is negative. So I would just have to look at how they have it worded. I think the CDC has it stated that the option could be if they test on day five or later and it's negative, they can return on day seven. Um, so I would refer you to the quarantine guidance from MDHHS and refer to what their guidance is there. Um, regarding the vaccine or the vaccine mandates, OSHA sent to the White House their recommendations on the 12th. So that's just a couple of days ago, higher level reviews are taking place, but we all are waiting um, the mandate employer rules. So, so things are in the works and um, and hopefully it's promised out by the end of October. So thanks, Ken, for the update. Um, so Bob is mentioning that they have test cards, but they don't have enough of the drop. Um, so again, I would have you, Bob, email the, um, the email address that you can find with the testing um, information on the state website. And again, if you're not having luck, email Major Uller and he can probably connect you with the right people. Um, any word on when the immunity for those who have had COVID will be updated for 90 days? No, but that is a really good question. I will ask um, our epidemiologist at the state. They do have meetings with the CDC on pretty regular occurrences, but that is a really good question. And I know it's been brought up before but I just wrote myself um, wrote myself a little note to email him and see if there's been any talk about that. All right. So there is a link from the major for the school ordering site uh, from MDHHS. And the next question is the quarantine guidance for close contacts living in the home, not separating from the family member with COVID, still the 10 days of isolation plus 10 days of quarantine. Um, yeah, it would be. So if you have, um, what we often see is if it's a little kiddo who just can't stay away from a sick parent, or if you have a setting where they just can't isolate apart, it's 10, the isolate, or sorry, quarantine is 10 to 14 days past their last day of exposure to someone who, who is good grief, who is contagious. So you have to wait for the person to stop being contagious, which is that 10 days of isolation. Then their clock starts for their quarantine. So it'd be at least 10 days, if not 14. So it'd be 20 to 24 days. Um, we do have um, the handout that illustrates that on our website to help explain that, hey, this is gonna be 20 days if you can't isolate separately from each other. Um, if you need a copy of that sent to you, let us know. But if you go to any of our web pages, um, under the school section, you will find it. it. On the top, it has a circle that says 10 and then 10 and then 20. So explaining the isolation time, the quarantine time, and the combination of the two if you can't isolate. So that was the last question in the chat box. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to add it in, or you can unmute yourself and ask. And like usual, I will, or we will send these slides out and the recording of the talk. Um, I will make sure and include uh, Major Uller's contact information in the email, um, mainly for those who are not on the call, just to draw their attention to it. Um, 
So I want to make sure people were aware that that was shared today. All right, last call for questions. All right, guys, well, I thank you for joining us and have a great weekend and we'll talk again next Thursday. Thank you.